You should be hearing the sultry sounds of uh, elevator music. Maybe uh, give me a thumbs up if you are. Laura, I can see your, yes, okay, Patrick, great. Fantastic, well, um, thank you all, welcome. No, Marie, not getting any audio? You are now? No audio, I will continue to check, but no audio right now. <laughs> all right, no worries at all. Um, thank you all, thanks for coming and, and welcome to the session. Um, you know, it looks like we're gonna have a pretty intimate group, which is great, so maybe a bit less formal. I did wear a tie today for the first time in a very long time, so you are, <laughs> are in for a treat, at least in terms of how I've uh, dressed myself, but uh, I'm really excited to be here, and thanks so much for the opportunity to join you all. My name is Spencer Ellis, and I work with the Colorado Department of Higher Education. I know you're coming off of a, a key, great keynote session with James and Una, um, and, and so I'll try to make this a bit more, you know, um, engaging. So, you know, if you all have questions as we get going through this um, presentation, please feel free to, to share them. And Shay and I will try and keep an eye on the chat and uh, do our best to answer your questions as they arise. So anyway, um, my name is Spencer. I work for the Colorado Department of Higher Education. We're a state agency under the governor's executive branch um, that administers education policy, coordinate statewide efforts in areas of academic and student affairs, financial aid and research. We're here to serve you, the educators, the students, the people of Colorado, the residents of Colorado. Um, and I wanted to start by thanking Vice President Runyon and the team, including Molly, Shay, Drew, and many others, I'm sure, who have coordinated this event. So thanks for arranging this event and allowing me some time to share more about open education from the state of Colorado's perspective. And welcome to the presentation. So we will jump right in. I bet you'll ne you've never seen an outline of a presentation in a donut chart before, but I'm just trying to give you like to discuss um, today. And again, as I mentioned, and it was uh, mentioned at the beginning of the session, if you have questions and they come up, please go ahead and you can unmute yourself. You can throw those in the chat. We'll try and keep an eye on the chat. Um, but I, I also put these goals up here to try and keep myself on track as I find myself feeling a uh, little like straying into other topics these days. So hopefully I'll maintain focus. You all can keep me honest. That said, these are some of our goals, discussing the larger picture, how and why the state of Colorado is involved in open educational resources, uh, the progress that's been made over the course of the last few years. And then we'll come for discussion as well. So um, before we get started, <laughs> I wanted to ask you all a question. Uh, I've put up this serene scene to invite you all to take a moment to just take a deep breath. Go ahead. Hmm. Clear, clear your minds. Um, you know, it is Friday, which is great. Um, and, and as you clear your minds and kind of look at these peaceful pictures, here's my question for you. How does the work that you're doing at Front Range connect to the larger picture? And you can define the larger picture. You don't have to answer this question either directly. So just real quick in the chat, um, we're seeing um, uh, some some people are not able to see the outline slide. Um, but I, uh, okay, yep, it looks like it just came through for some people. Sorry to interrupt everyone. All right, looks like we have some people that can see it now. We're back on track? Yes. Okay. Um, how about now? Can you all still see? can see the waterfall. All right. Take that. Are we still all right? Yeah, it looks like we're okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we're looking at a waterfall, everyone. Great. Yeah, we're looking at a waterfall. Exactly. So um, we're talking about, you know, the bigger picture. So in, in light of recent events in our country at the outset of this year, over the course of the last five years, and arguably over the course of the last decade, or even more, um, it's important to remember what role education can play in shaping systems and motivating change. Of course, we have our day to day, but I often am inspired to reflect on why we do what we do and how we play the role in the larger conversation. So when I ask you to keep this in mind today, I ask you to keep this in mind, you know, the bigger picture on the whole, uh, anytime we, we meet to talk about open education or any other topic for that matter. So um, with that, I'd also like to say thank you for the difference that you're making in learners, colleagues and families lives, you know, all the interactions that you have. Uh, I know the past year has been something that we, none of us had expected. So 
Thank you for doing what you do. Okay, moving on. So um, open back to open education, back from this kind of higher level view. Um, thank you for indulging me. I'm talking about the bigger picture and perhaps how it pertains to education and, and more specifically to open education. I think you heard a little bit um, more about the why behind open education from the keynote speakers. On a global scale, as this, this particular session highlighted, um, there's, there's big interest in open education and open educational resources. UNESCO, the UN's branch of, of education work um, and scientific work, administers much of this work. And so you see laid out here in front of you um, some of their initiatives and some of their interest in getting involved. Um, you know, they have these recommendations for, for practitioners, uh, for people administering open education, and it's really all in, in kind of uh, motion towards the sustainable development goal to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. Um, and they really see education as a human right, which I think a lot of us do. And, and so just kind of reminding folks that this OER movement is really on a global scale. Um, they have this program, there's a program that UNESCO works with, the Open Education for a Better World. Some of our colleague, Colorado colleagues have participated in this. And so when we're talking about OER, um, I think we should talk about it in a global context. Though we may be acting locally in our sphere of influence, um, beginning the conversation, you can see global interaction through open education. Um, and like I mentioned before, a lot of these programs bring people together on that transnational scale. So personally, I believe global competencies in any discipline will enhance one's education um, and student success. Data and research from high impact practices such as study abroad help us to understand that that is true, that there is a positive impact on the student's experience. And I think educational resources can also play a role in enhancing those global competencies. Um, so I thought this was a fun activity to start out with here. If I can click through, let me see if I can click through. Um, you know, why are, why are global competencies important, right? Um, and maybe some of you have seen some of these graphics that I'm about to share with you uh, that are put together by a Chinese German artist named Yang Liu. Um, she, she drew on her experience as somebody who grew up uh, part of her life in China and part of her life in Germany and put together these really interesting infographics for interpreting everyday life from Chinese and German perspectives. Um, so the blue side represents German point of view. Spencer, yes, just really quick, it looks like we have some people that are still on the waterfall. Um, I wanted to request if you could maybe, um, maybe uh, remove the closed caption. It looks like there's a lag going on there and maybe that'll catch some people up on the connection end. Um, and I'm still on a waterfall too. Yep. Let me see what I can do here. Bear okay. with me. I'm so sorry to interrupt. No, no, I'm glad you did. Thank you. But we were trying to make it. <laughs> as, no, as, you, missed, uh, you missed our uh, as, UNESCO As accommodating goals. as possible. <laughs> and you may have to reshare again. Um, yeah, it looks like I'm, I'm on a bit starting of a from that graphic. Too. I can hear you guys, but I think I've lost. Bear with me just one sec. I may have to log out and log back in, Shay. I'm sorry. Okay. All right, looks like I am back. Let me see if I can get my screen back.
Okay, are you all back with me? Um, yes, so it looks like we have the screen, um, the blue graphic, but there's no, there's nothing in it. Yes, correct. Oh, okay, okay. You, you see one box now? Yes. <clears throat> okay, well, sorry folks, sorry for the delay. We're, we were talking a little bit about the importance of global perspectives. I was getting ready to share with you some of these really cool infographics um, from a Chinese artist that I, that I wanted to share. Kind of, you know, talking about the role of open educational resources in helping develop some of those global competencies. Um, as is our theme of our, uh, our session here, uh, thinking globally and acting locally. So anyway, these are a number of, of graphics that this, this artist had shared um, with her experience growing up partially in China and partially in Germany. So again, the blue side represents uh, her interpretation of, of topics um, from the Chinese context. Uh, I'm sorry, the blue side is from the German context and the red side is from the Chinese context. And so um, as you go through these, it's kind of fun to, to to see the different perspectives just on daily life, right? And I, I wanted to kind of just share this because it's fun to get the juices flowing. And then as we think about that in the educational context. So this particular, this first graphic is how do populations uh, think about meals? So in Germany, you know, you have a cold meal in the morning, maybe you have a warm meal at lunch and then you have a, a cold meal in the evening, I guess. I don't know, I haven't spent much time in Germany um, eating meals, but I have spent time in China and I do know that they do prefer hot meals at every meal. So um, that's pretty interesting graphic there. The next one, anybody want to venture a guess of what this represents? You can speak up or share a chat. I think we'll have somebody lining up exactly, Kathleen, you know, lining up in the queue. Um, and this is how you join a line um, in Germany, you know, maybe to not to many people's surprise, those lines form into kind of one by one um, in China. And I can attest to this, you know, when you go to run on the train, you know, you kind of move into a little bit of a, a swarm and, and funnel in that way. So um, interesting conceptualization again, from her perspective. Um, this one, venture in, I guess. Pretty easy, I think with the clocks, you know, um, concept of time, right? And so um, concept of being on time. And, and some people might say, if you're on time, you're late, right? That might be this uh, very, uh, and, and what, we, what we talk about too in kind of the, the cultural context is high context cultures and low context cultures, right? Um, so Germany would be a very low context culture. If you're on time, you're on time. It's very clear. Um, in, in, Ger in China, it's more of the high context. And, and so we have that little bit of a you know, 15, 20 minute window where you could still be considered on time. Um, how about this next conceptualization? You can see here, I don't know if we saw any, any guesses in the chat. <laughs> it's all like the tall comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, this is how this is how the boss is seen, the Ling Dao. How do we see the boss? You know, in, in, in Western contexts, a lot of the time we like to say that having a flat organization is a good thing, right? Our by my boss is very approachable. Uh, we're a peers. We're 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 in this together. Um, so you see in Germany that yeah maybe a little bit of, of head and shoulders above the rest of the the, the crowd, but in China m more hierarchical. So um, interesting conceptualization again. And you can see if if we're training students to work in a global environment, right? And they have these different contexts, maybe from the Western perspective, and they go they secure a job. Um, you know, where, where perhaps the other cultural norms are, are, the, are the key, how could it be to the benefit of students to have more of those global perspectives? Last one to just marinate on as we kind of move through this. Um, this is a tough one, so I'll just go straight to it. This is a concept of the ego. So um, if you want to think about individualistic versus collectivist societies, um, and this is the concept of the ego from this artist's perspective. So again, just re relaying the value of, of um, cultural competencies within the context of, you know, this individual's artwork, but also within the, the context of our educational resources. And again, my, my hypothesis is that educational resources can play a role in enhancing these competencies. Drilling down a little bit further, um, you can see the U.S. Department of Education is very interested in open educational resources. In 2021, uh, they re renewed funding, the feds renewed funding for OER, bringing the total funding to over $24 million um, since 2018. So lots of money being put into this for 
you know, nationally competitive programs, um, and they call it the uh, Open Textbook Pilot Program. It's still called pilot program after three and a half years, um, but something that out of the office of EdTech, excuse me, and um, something that they're, they're really excited about kind of um, enhancing throughout the country. And so you see some of their other priorities laid out here for, um, you know, the infrastructure necessary to these types of, uh, from the office of EdTech, I should say, infrastructure necessary to these types of concepts of, um, you know, supporting everywhere learning all the time, something that we've been kind of knee deep in, if not up to our necks in uh, this past year throughout the pandemic. So um, part of that infrastructure is, is access to materials. And so I think that the Office of Ed Tech is very interested in continuing to expand equitable, accessible materials through open educational resources. At the and drilling down even further here in Colorado and for the agency that I work for, Colorado Department of Higher Education, open education aligns quite nicely uh, with our goals for expanding access, equity, and affordability, and advancing student success. Some of the things that you heard about during the keynote. And our goals um, for the CDHE map to your goals at Front Range. And, and your goals at Front Range map to ours. It's a very mutual relationship. And we work with all the institutions to ensure that policies are useful and helpful to advance all these goals. And so what you're seeing before here is strategic goals from the Colorado Commission on Higher Education, which is our governing board. And really OER folds nicely into, I would argue, all of these goals. Um, and, and some of that was touched on through, through the, the keynote. Um, so we all seem to be moving in the same direction. Uh, we, we also know that OER work in Colorado began much earlier than when the state got involved. Uh, so again, applauding you all who've been in this and we wanna leverage that spirit of innovation on your campus and, and in the state. In 2017 is really when the Department of Higher Ed got involved, we sought to investigate further if open educational resources were viable and something of interest for educators, students, um, you know, districts, so we put out a survey and overwhelmingly so people were very excited about getting involved. Um, and this helped to inform a proposal that went to, to the State General Assembly as, as a bill, a funded bill to create the OER grant program among other trainings and, and opportunities. Um, again, all in an effort to advance affordability, access, student success, equity throughout the, the, the state. Um, and to date through the OER grant program, we've saved students in Colorado over four million dollars. And I do know that we have two grantees at Front Range, one for English language course, and then Vice President Runyon also has a, an, inst an institutional grant program that's run that you all may or may not be familiar with. Um, so this is part of the administration's roadmap uh, for higher education, as I mentioned before, and you kind of saw that on, on some of the graphics previously. So Governor Polis is a huge proponent of this work, which you see here, you know, he came to our OER conference with some other um, leaders last year, and I've got a picture picture coming up on that, but, you know, he's put it into his roadmap for, for college, uh, cutting college costs. And then you see some of our metrics here on, on some of the uh, work that's been done throughout the state, reaching over 30,000 enrolled students, addressing over 100 courses in our first year of the grant program. Here you see, uh, among others, uh, the chancellor of the community college system, who you, you may see, uh, Joe Garcia, <clears throat> um, Congressman Nagus, who may be your congressman, he is right there on the right-hand side of the photo. He came to our OER event. Uh, Dr. Angie Piccioni, who is our executive director, is standing right next to the, uh, the governor there. And then on the left side of the screen are all of our OER advocates, many members of our OER council. So super exciting to see the enthusiasm at all levels. And usually after I show that picture, I show this, uh, this next graphic, which I'll show you in just a second. The, um, I should mention the chart on the left shows you some of the return on the investments from some of the initial grants. So great work being done across the state and many of these institutions, you see Pikes Peak Community College in, in particular has their own little spotlight for the amazing work that they're able to leverage throughout their, their faculty. Um, some people are like, I don't care about the governor. I don't care about, you know, I totally get it. Um, but there's, a, there's an important role for everybody to play. And that's why I show this graphic. Um, governmental leaders and policy, you know, they help us build that foundation. And, and if we have that, it enables us to invest in resources. I saw some of the chat discussion from the keynote address was, you know, OER isn't free, 
right? It costs us time and money. It costs us resources. And absolutely is true, especially from the institutional or educator perspective. But if the government leaders and policymakers can make that investment, there's more incentive for participation or there's more compensation for participation. So, and rightfully so, you know, people should be compensated for this. So that's kind of at the, at the bottom of the deck here. And, and what I like to say, we're, we're trying to stack the, stack the deck for students. Uh, but that links very naturally into what's being implemented on campuses, what you all are doing at, at Front Range, what uh, Vice President Runyon is, is administering through this particular training grant program, or through this particular training program. Um, so subject matter experts in, in all areas and in, in all disciplines come together, use, adapt, create, and otherwise implement OER and other innovative practices to kind of push this forward. And again, the ultimate benefit is for the students through cost savings and tailored and enhanced um, learning pedagogical practices or learning experiences. So that's one thing we're really excited about um, continuing to support here in the state of Colorado. And this is how we see you know, the governor being in, very important to championing this work and uh, being one of our biggest advocates to help us push this forward so that we can at the campus level continue to implement um, in, in the way that it should be um, compensated for educators spending the time and effort. But uh, you don't have to take my word for it. And I want you to hear about some of the other work going on around the state. So I'm going to reshare my screen. Bear with me, I forgot to share the audio. Now let's see if this um, will work this time. And I'm going to show you a video from a professor at CSU Pueblo who's going to tell you a little bit more about her uh, work in open education. de español en CSU Pueblo, una pequeña universidad regional con un alto porcentaje de estudiantes hispanos y de primera generación. Creating OERs allows us to offer free relevant content that reflects our students' experiences, which is key to their success. In my field of language teaching, we have a large number of students who grow up speaking Spanish at home. This group has traditionally been forced into textbooks designed for second language learners with terrible outcomes. I have developed OERs for content-based classes about food, health, and linguistics. In them, my students can see their experiences reflected and develop their language skills through the use of authentic materials that are relevant and appealing. Through open educational practices, our students share their unique voices with the world. In my music and society class, students developed a 214-page book with topics relevant to them. In my food and society class, they created a website with recipes, children's books, and explorations of food and identity. Now, others can read about how a young Latino man expresses his multiculturalism through his love of tortillas, frijoles, pizza, and pumpkin pie. So really cool stuff being done at CSU Pueblo um, with uh, Dr. Alegria. Uh, fantastic work within the discipline of Spanish, obviously. And I wanna share with you another example from completely different uh, world, the world of STEM. And so this is a professor at CU Anschutz, uh, the medical campus, which we are all very thankful for uh, during the course of this past year and of course, always. But let's hear from uh, Professor Vergara, a little bit more about their open educational resources work. Thank you for, uh, for your help with the OER initiative because it has really transformed education in our campus. OER did not, almost did not exist in this campus just a few years ago. And it took uh, just a group of like-minded people interested in OER to get it started. But really the grant last year mm -hmm. is what really got the program working. Mm -hmm. And through the grant, we were able to develop this program where we were able to educate a large cohort of faculty and now they are incorporating OER in their courses and uh, we're moving on with other aspects of the program now and moving on. Our campus has a very uh, unique characteristic that we are creators of knowledge as well. Mm -hmm. And I think we can fill a niche that maybe other campuses cannot mm -hmm. in that we can not only um, 
incorporate OER in our courses, but we can generate OER yes. that can be used around the world. Really, these resources can be used anywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's what inspires us. But mm -hmm. getting the grant again this yes. year has been yeah. fantastic because it's really going to help our efforts here. We, we really couldn't do it without it. So. Yeah, Ah, mm -hmm. Natalia Vergara. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. So that was actually an ad hoc video taken by our director. She had happened to be touring, learning more about some of the programs that they had at CU Anschutz. And uh, this professor came up and said, hey, we got the, the CDHE OER grant and I wanted to tell you a little bit more about it. So great to see, you know, from the research perspective, um, how, how OER kind of impacts and influences um, the culture on the campus and how what they're doing can be turned into OER, if you will. Um, last perspective I wanted to share is not a video, but a case study from a fellow community college. Um, and I had mentioned this in the, in the keynote chat. And so this is from Professor Melissa Randall, who spent years um, working in, in law before becoming a professor. So moving from practitioner to, um, to educator later on in her career. But um, you know, Melissa is fantastic. I, I've spoken with her before. She's just passionate about working with the students to co-create content. And so what they did was they co-wrote this book, um, essentially with Melissa and her colleagues, her law uh, colleagues as expert editors and, and obviously contributors. You know, she has an extensive network of, of colleagues within the, um, the world of, uh, of law. And so for her course, she came together with the students and they developed this text together, which is an OER that's now available and been adopted in, in over five states is what she told me. So that's fantastic. Um, but what's even more exciting, I think too, is not only the cost savings, you know, of course, between those five states, they've, send, they've saved the students millions of dollars, which is fantastic. Um, but she sees this as a, as, a, as a work in open pedagogy. And so again, kind of inviting the students to help tailor their experience with her as the subject matter expert, of course. Um, and she said, you know, we're raising the bar for engagement. We're raising the bar for um, kind of the, the student participation. We're also enhancing the, the learning. And so she's documented, you know, advanced um, outcomes with the use of this course uh, material, even though the, the rigor has also stepped up from her perspective. So she's in the midst of kind of scaling up further courses. Uh, but this is just a really neat example of how how one can work with um, students in and this was actually part of their project um, from what I remember was part of their project for the students through a couple of cohorts of this class. So now they've got a product. I'm sure they're working on whatever's next. All right, so those are a few case studies kind of throughout the state of Colorado just to hear what some other faculty are doing. Here's the other thing that I wanted to invite you all to do. Our job at CDHE, and somebody mentioned this in the chat during the keynote as well, is we need to share a little bit better about what's going on in the state. You know, perhaps you share a discipline uh, with somebody who's doing really great work or somebody's looking for a partner or they have an OER grant and they're looking for contributions, you know, chapters to their book that they're writing, what have you. Um, so this is the current blueprint that we have for what we're calling a referatory, basically a, a little mini library. Uh, that we want to build here in Colorado. We invite people to take a look, um, let us know what OER you might be um, working in on your campus, or um, you know, if you see your campus represented and some of these fields are not filled, filled out. So I'll kind of show you how the spreadsheet works. Essentially, if you look here at Red Rocks Community College, they've got this general college biology course that they're working on in OER. And these, we got this list, this list is generated by our OER grantees. So these are known OER users throughout the state of Colorado. Um, it's got the course number, of course. And then if there is a Gen Ed uh, GT Pathways designation, we're also trying to note that because we know these are high enrollment courses. So there could be high impact in terms of sharing these uh, for thousands of students across the state. And then what people have done here in this category is kind of linked to whatever resources they've created or they are using. So um, uh, I, I think you see here, you all are probably familiar with the Learning Object Repository, uh, but some other folks are using some of these curation guides from, from CCC Online, which, which was an original OER grant program project. Um, some of them are using the Open Textbook, um, Open Education Network, I should call them, which is basically uh, an online library of, of open educational resources. And so this here, we're trying to track and do a better job of sharing what we know is going on throughout the state. So that's 
ultimately we want this to be in a, a prettier format, certainly more user-friendly format, but right now we're starting as a big long spreadsheet. Um, and yes, I will put the link in the chat most certainly. I have a few other things that I'm gonna share with you all and I'll make sure to bundle those up to share with you. So that's one place to start as we kind of get you all involved and, and start this call to action. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to mention is that Front Range is, is doing great work. I mean, 80 people in that opening keynote, which is really amazing. Uh, Vice President Runyon is, is doing fantastic work with, your, uh, with, with her OER committee. And so just to let you all know that FRCC has a grant fund and a committee. So if you haven't already been called to action, tap them. Um, or maybe we can find out from Shay or others who are, who are the members of that OER committee so that we can kind of get, um, get connected. I see your question, Anne, and let's come back to that. Let's have a discussion about that in just a few minutes. I have a few more resources to run through with you all. <clears throat> um, number two, call to action, talk to a librarian. Uh, librarians are kind of the, the wizards of this world. And so um, they're, they're familiar with the licensing. They're familiar, obviously, with the existing OER and can often help navigate or at least open up the conversation for this. Uh, you could review a textbook through the Open Education Network. I think one person had mentioned in the um, keynote address, you know, well, what if um, this is great that people can create their co own content, but what if the person creating the content is wrong? Or what if they're racist, I think was the example used. Um, Yes, that's why things need to be peer reviewed, right? Um, and so through the Open Education Network, things can be peer reviewed. Um, OER content can be peer reviewed. I've seen another and couple of things pop up in the since chat. Since we have a quick question, um, are there compensated positions open to part-time instructors on that FRCC OER committee? Good question, Laura. Um, I'm not sure that's a great question for Jean. Um, and I can look into that too as well. I'm not sure how the OER committee is formed. That's something that we kind of leave open to each campus interpretation. And so I know that um, most of our campuses now throughout the state, we have 31 public institutions. I think most of them have some form of an OER committee or council or you know, work group task force, um, but they all look different at each campus. So for Front Range, I'm not quite sure uh, about the structure. Um, and you're, you're thinking it's only open to full-time faculty at the moment. I, I would say, I mean, I'm not in charge of that, but I would say certainly um, contingent faculty or, or, um, or others, other contributors, certainly I think that, that we should have um, as much involvement as possible. So um, it's worth a conversation and, and I'd love to learn more, um, more about who's involved and how we can get more folks involved. For our OER council, I can tell you at the state level, we have a number of faculty members. It, it's funny, actually, a lot of them come from STEM, which, you know, at the outset of our, our kind of our program, I, I didn't anticipate that for some odd reason, but we have a math professor from CSU Pueblo, we have a chemistry professor from MSU Denver. We have a physics professor from uh, Colorado Mesa. And then we have, um, uh, uh, well, uh, I guess former faculty member, now administrator um, from the community college system. But uh, yeah, number of faculty on ours. And great point, yes, science books are very expensive. We also, we used to have an art historian on our uh, OER council because art history books are quite expensive too, particularly with the high resolution um, images that, that are often used. Just to run through the rest of these real quick, um, ongoing trainings workshops through the Open Education Ambassadors Program, we are always calling people to action. Um, so uh, to get back to the question that was posed earlier, you know, how are we sharing these resources? The intent this year, you know, after about a year and a half of the grant program, we do have some projects coming to fruition, which is fantastic. So faculty can now kind of um, showcase their work. And so through the Open Education Ambassadors Program, I think the, the intent this year is to provide some kind of um, obviously showcase, uh, but maybe a little bit more discussion with fellow faculty as well. So we're not sure if we're gonna arrange that by discipline or by um, institution or by um, what, what other, uh, other various topics, but I know that there's a lot of discussion about how we want to do that. So if you all want to get involved and help us um, by your discipline or any other sort of um, faculty or academic group that you're a part of, please contact me. I'd be happy to, to work with you all. 
Um, and that's part of the number five. And then number six, um, you know, if you're, if you're thinking that what, like what was mentioned during the keynote, OER is not free, which I completely agree with. Um, free to whom, I guess is the question, right? Um, free to the students, but certainly an investment from the educator, from the institutional perspective. And so having this grant program the past couple of years has been something that has given the incentive for people who are interested in participating. Um, and we have all, all manners of, of grantees. So we have folks who have applied for our small group grants, grants excuse me, for as little as $2,500. Um, to, fo to institutions like MSU Denver that I mentioned before, who have re uh, received very large institutional grants because they have these broader institutional um, involvement. And so, uh, like I said, you, you can apply as an individual or a handful of individuals or, you know, co-collaborators. And I'll show you some of those projects where people did do that. There's a great project out of CSU that's just wrapping up um, that I'm going to show you all. And if you're interested in doing that, you can do that on the, as far as in our eligibility is concerned, you can do that on the um, individual level. You don't, it doesn't have to be an institutional proposal. Um, our OER council, as I mentioned before, is a 15 member council, many, uh, several librarians, instructional designers, we have some administrators and certainly faculty, and then one student representative on this council. These are kind of the broad goals that they've set forth for OER in, in the state. So building structure, building culture, and building evidence. We want to understand, you know, what structures will enable further support, adoption, adaption, um, or OER kind of culture on the campuses. So that, that's part of what we put into our report and part of what we ask of our grantees to help us report on. We want to build culture. We want to, you know, provide more of these opportunities similar to what um, you all are participating in today, which I'm very thankful you're a part of, but we want to provide more of these opportunities and perhaps, you know, as I was mentioning before, we want to get discipline specific. It could be really fun to get together with um, fellow faculty throughout the state in your particular um, discipline and, and talk about open educational resources, you know, things that you're excited about, things, things you're fearful of. Um, and then and move away forward for kind of interinstitutional collaboration. And then of course, measuring the progress um, through kind of documenting, you know, key data points um, and building kind of a, a evidential case of, of what is the impact of OER beyond the student cost savings, right? We heard a little bit more about that Georgia study. I think James had mentioned in the keynote, which um, they had seen some great student success metric outcomes, particularly for Pell eligible students um, and, and we want to learn a little bit more about that picture here in Colorado as well. Um, so let me share with you now briefly just a couple of projects and then I'll happily take more questions. So I had mentioned the, uh, the professor at uh, Colorado State University who he is actually building this engineering statics um, textbook OER. I'm sorry, OER, I should call it not a textbook, but it, it is an OER and this is kind of the first uh, uh, edition of it, if you will. And so if you look down here at the bottom, he says, you know, we got a grant from the Colorado Department of Higher Ed. We had support from CSU Digital Learning Initiative. Fantastic. Here's his collaborators, you know, Cal Poly, Wisconsin. Um, so awesome to see that he's championing this work for his discipline. Statics is a, a, a gateway engineering course. And so a very common course uh, that he did not see a good OER for, so he decided to create himself. One that worked for his course, one that worked uh, with his colleagues here in, in his discipline. So really cool to see that. Um, I mentioned this, this is another project that was funded. So this is Colorado's top uh, gen ed courses, top 40. These are curation guides from CCC online. Um, so if you click here through the, to the curation guides, let's see if this will pop up for me. It'll walk you through by discipline and by uh, course, I guess. Um, and so if you clicked on one of these, for example, anthropology, what you'd be provided with is this um, content that has been curated by the librarians and subject matter experts at CCCS um, and CCC online to help one who may be investigating or looking further into adapting some materials for their course. Um, it kind of gives you the breakdown of the license, you know, um, and, and maps to all these different competencies and outcomes for the gen ed course. So if this is something that you're interested, it's a great starting point and another project that was funded. Um, here is the textbook that, that was funded through um, CCD, as I mentioned before. 
you know, it's on the open textbook library. So again, kind of has that national scope and has been adopted in other states. And then the last thing I was going to mention to you all, if you come to our landing page, you can kind of get a little bit more access to some of these resources. Um, I mentioned before, the governor just awarded Zero Textbook Cost Challenge uh, winners. So uh, there are some colleagues throughout the state who won some awards from the governor. And that's what this Zero Textbook Cost Challenge um, uh, initiative was about here. We've got a little bit more about upcoming events and conferences, and things like that. You'll see we haven't had anything planned for 2021 yet. Um, but if you do want to look back at our archive of events from the previous years, we have various presentations that have been recorded. We were big on Zoom before the pandemic because we have this statewide scope that we try to address. Um, and so a lot of these presentations were conducted via Zoom. Um, and you'll see we've invited people from around the state, uh, around the state of Colorado, but also from around the country to tell us a little bit more about um, OER and their particular um, projects. So, um, you know, fa fascinating topics from, you know, high, high level stuff, our training with the Open Education Network to um, LGBTQ and OER, you know, practices for incorporating LGBTQ into OER practices. Um, Jennifer Kidd is a professor in the School of Education at Old Dominion University, told us Sorry about that, lost my headphones. Um, told us a little bit more about the projects that she had pursued and the book that she co-wrote with her um, students and then various other kind of presentations on uh, whether they be helpful tools or resources. So these are some of the other things that we've offered. Um, that's about it for what I wanted to show you all. And I'm happy to take further questions and, um, and suggestions. Spencer, we have had uh, several requests um, to provide links uh, for um, several of the slides and resources. I tried to do that through um, through the PowerPoint that I had, but it wouldn't let me. Womp womp. Um, <laughs> no problem. I'm sure everyone would. I'm sure everyone would appreciate that. Thanks, guys, for asking. Yeah, and let me um, let me drop drop this in. So I'm going to drop probably the ones that are that are most requested. So. Here's just our little landing page, which you can kind of get to most of the content <clears throat> from this page. It's, it's a page that needs to be refreshed. So please, no judgment zone. <clears throat> but we do have links to um, other resources there. Here are the curation guides from CCCS. And then here is here are the previously recorded workshops and again we're soliciting input um, for workshops in 2021 we'd love to hear from you all about projects that you have going on and I wanted to come back around to the question that was you know how are we making this information known to faculty um, that that is part of what kind of the intent of this network through our grantees so we have contacts through, and 26 of the 28 public institutions that are eligible for OER grant funds have received a grant award. Part of the requirement to receive a grant is to have some form of a committee. Um, and so, yes, we're, we, we haven't gone to every uh, faculty um, you know, work group specifically, but we're, we're doing our best to kind of uh, bring this as we're seeing some of these projects now complete, which is really exciting to see after, after the um, investment. Um, we're kind of coming full circle to see, you know, how people might be able to showcase some of these. So whether they be through a workshop, uh, we do have an annual conference, which I mentioned before. Uh, there was a, a national conference this past fall. Um, it's, I think it's, it's just called Open Ed. Open Education Conference, Open Ed 2020. We were meant to, oh, and I see we have a little one that joined us. Hey there. Um, we were meant to actually host the conference here in Denver, uh, but that did not happen because of the pandemic, of course. And so we, we had a virtual conference, but I know several folks from, uh, I believe Red Rocks and CCD, CU, uh, Metro presented at the conference. And so getting the word out there to uh, a little bit more about their work that they, they've been doing in the state. So um, one of the hard things to do that we, we haven't been able to do in, in terms of gathering our data picture of the state is knowing about all of the OER. Often the, the, the case that we hear or the story that we hear is, well, I was just using these materials that I created and 
I didn't know that they would, they could be considered OER, you know, technically maybe they're not OER because I didn't put the open license on them, but I've shared them for years with my colleagues, right? Uh, my sister is a, a language professor. And so I know that she and her, her kind of, uh, I've talked to her about this too. And I know that she and her, her colleagues have for years shared materials without stamping them with the, the OER stamp, so to speak, the open license. But there could be some real good practical use to maybe convening and formalizing that content and then putting it into the open education network to be peer reviewed and then adopted on a wider scale. So, um, and I think you had a great point about this is this is part of the challenge is understanding who's using what and then being able to share that back with folks to say, here's some really cool things that you might find fun. Maybe you take a piece from, from Spencer's book and then you take a piece from Anne's book and then you have uh, a third piece that you add, it's original content, and now you have the ideal text for your course, right? Um, if things work that neat, neatly, which I knew, I know they do not, but um, that is that is part of the challenge for sure. Are there other questions or requests for specific links can get you that information too? Oh, the last link I should share with you actually is our little referatory spreadsheet. I'm I'm half embarrassed to share this spreadsheet because it's just it's kind of sloppy right now, but I think that that's a good thing because we want help tightening it up. Oh, actually, if I put in some words, kind of helps delineate where the actual link is. Um, and if you go here, like I said, there's over 300 courses listed, and these are just known. These are the known, again, in Colorado. So check out your institution. If you're interested in finding out um, who at you say you, you're at front range, you're working in chemistry, you see somebody at front range, or you see that front range is listed for a chemistry course, we can put you in contact. You might already know that person, right? Uh, or maybe somebody at Red Rocks, you want to connect with them because they teach the same course. Um, you can reach out to us and we'll get you connected with that particular individual. Um, and, and that's a good way to kind of continue sharing too. But again, eventually, this is, this is just a blueprint. So eventually we will have a bit um, friendlier user experience when it comes to kind of navigating and searching for these resources. Questions, concerns, suggestions? Messages for the governor? Just joking. I just, I would just like to say, I mean, I think, I think the weak point right now is communication. I mean, I think there's a huge amount of, I mean, for instance, I wrote a book four years ago. Nobody knows about it. I've saved my students $350,000 personally, right, over those four years because I, I run a lot of sections. I'm a lead instructor. I share with all my instructors, but no one knows about it, right? I, I don't know how to tell people about it. I've told people at my college and they don't care, <laughs> but um, I, it, it's it's this lack of 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 you know ability to share or knowledge how to share or it's the sort of no nobody's asking nobody's um nobody's going to people and saying hey what what's already existing and i, I think that needs to happen i mean that right now in our state there's probably 90 percent of the oer is not being shared because no one knows how to share it yeah, I feel like we need compensated teams of people who can then focus and dedicate their time to this um, across the state and across the country and across the world. Um, but I do think that that would make a really big difference if it wasn't just, um, you know, people who are interested and willing to donate their time. Um, I, I did serve on an open network team um, years ago and um, it, you know, having like a dedicated team makes a huge difference in what you can accomplish. Well, and we have, I mean, I'm on the OER committee at Front Range, <laughs> so we have a committee. Um, cool, and it's not even open to part-time instructors, right? Well, and like I'm saying, I mean, I'm on the committee and, and I'm not getting this information. <laughs> so a bigger committee with people really dedicated to it, you know, collating resources, seeking them out, assessing them. I, three people is not enough. And I know there's a lot of interest, but... Honestly, part-time instructors are paid below poverty wage. We don't have extra time for stuff like that in general. Um, you know, it's like some of us out of the goodness of our heart can donate some time, but realistically, if it's a compensated position, you're gonna get a lot um, more effective resources out of it. 
I agree with you completely, Laura. And I would say, again, just to reiterate the point, I, I understand that the, um, well, I'm just going to say it, the bureaucracy on your campus may be different than what uh, exists for our standards. But as far as the state of Colorado is concerned, um, faculty could put together a proposal, any, any type of faculty, really any educators. Um, and we use that, that term broadly to be, you know, what, what it, whatever it, that means to, to the educator. I mean, librarians are educators and they're often leading a lot of these initiatives too. Um, I understand that's different than the, than the um, adjunct faculty, but uh, regardless, you know, I, I think your eligibility for participating is, is certainly just being a Colorado educator from where we stand. And I understand that that works differently on your campus and that might be more of an idealist response, um, but we'd love to get people involved at any level that they're willing. Um, and, and back to your point, Anne, about sharing this information, I think you're, you're exactly right that uh, this, this can be part of the barrier. And it is actually a double, it's a double-edged sword. Is, is that the term that I'm looking for? The reason why is because reporting on what course materials you're using is not currently required of institutions in Colorado. So when you all turn in, when, you're, when your IR department turns in all manners of, of data and information that, that passes uh, to the IPEDS data, the National Clearinghouse data for enrollment and you know, uh, DFW rates, uh, things of that nature at the state level, there's no provision currently for reporting course materials. You can see why that is what it is because that's quite a burden. And also, I, I, frankly, I think there'd be some pushback so what we do have in policy and what is actually required of the institutions starting 2021 fall, this coming fall, is to report known OER courses in some form or fashion. And so your institutions will be required to do that. I know that CCCS on the whole, and I'm not sure if this goes for Front Range as well, but is attempting to make that designation through the course registration portal. Um, and so essentially when a student goes to register and when, when a course has been um, uh, you know, loaded into the system on the student for the student facing registration, that information will have been gleaned from faculty. And so eventually I think we'll get there. And that might be one way we can uh, kind of understand who's using what, but just I think there's- Just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but just, it just made me laugh because a couple of years ago we asked if we could put that designation and we were told Banner couldn't do it. Guess <laughs> so, what? Just so you know. Yeah, guess what? <laughs> now they have to. So okay. that was part of, part of the bill. So, um, and it doesn't have to be at the point of registration. So point of clarification from the actual policy, but it does have to be, it does have to be, uh, uh, present for students in, in some form or fashion. So for example, at Ames Community College, they have their free to suit students initiative, F2S is what they call it. They have a website with all of their OER information and then a list of all the courses that are, be, that are using OER that they know of. Um, that meets the standard, that meets the criteria of the policy, but there are also, also some institutions that are putting it at the point of registration. So Anne, I think that you may have little bit easier uh, time and I'd love to help you um, kind of poke and prod whoever it is on campus to, to see if we can get that back in there because we'd love to showcase your your, your work and, and certainly build kind of the yeah, broader network. And, and if at the bare minimum, if I have to put on my town crier outfit, um, I, I have to dust it off in the closet, but it is there and uh, we're gonna get the word out definitely. Yeah. Good. That, that's key. I, just another story. I mean, my colleague next door to me has decided, like she took years thinking about it because it's so much work to do an OER textbook. And she finally wrote a small grant and um, to, I think she got one of your grant, one of our institution grants. And um, she's now writing it um, for Bio 112. And just on that list you just flashed up there, I saw two Bio 112 already existing. One at CCC Online, one I think Pikes Peak maybe. And she didn't know about those. Like she could have saved her. She's reinventing the wheel right now. And for no reason, except that she didn't know. And that, that's, that's, that's a big failing when, when we have, you know, I'm sure there's hundreds of other faculty doing the same thing. That's exactly right. And obviously from a state perspective, leveraging 
kind of the progress that and and the talent, quite frankly, that it, that is here in the state is something is, is is a starting point that we would like to <laughs> accentuate for people who are are kind of um, starting to you know, dip their toe into this world. Uh, uh, the other thing I'll say from the let me check this chat here real quick. Um, yeah, thanks for those of you who had to leave. Uh, understand and and totally get it. From the state policy perspective, so we were, uh, our original bill was a one-year bill, 2017 to 2018. Our second bill was from 2018 to 2021. Uh-oh, 2021 is upon us, which means we need to renew our bill to continue to support this work. And so that's kind of where we're at now so that you all understand from a state perspective, you can understand with the budget crunch, the pandemic and the economic uh, recovery, you know, there are other priorities lingering out there. But we are trying to convey the importance of, you know, investing in in teaching and learning, essentially. And so hopefully we'll get something renewed and we'll have some some form of um, grant program. If not, at the very least, the department intends to continue with uh, the uh, training and development support and infrastructural support and communications, quite frankly. And I think is a great way to package that up to say, you know, maybe we can have some centralized uh, resources that people can go to when they're when they're getting started. So. Um, yeah, I know, and we must be getting close to time because I see other people are, are having to dip out, but thank you all very much. Um, feel free to shoot me an email. I will put my email in the chat here and um, make myself available to you at, at your will. So if you want to scream and shout at state employees for being lazy, by all means, I'm a, I'll, I'll lend my ear. Uh, but if you, yeah, in all seriousness, if you all have feedback, please do. Yeah, and I'm going to throw my email address in there. I'm the librarian at the Boulder County campus. And and to your point about uh, communication is that um, even with the communication between librarians, between the different campuses, it's a bit strained. So anything to build the communication model, not only amongst librarians, but librarian to faculty, uh, part-time faculty, part-time staff, et cetera, um, communication is key. And so I'll provide that information so we can all get the ball rolling and get this information to the students and uh, build some successful uh, professionals. Thank you, Shay. Yep. Thanks all. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. Happy weekends. Happy surviving of the outset of this year. <laughs> Hope you all are doing all right. Yeah, thank you. And Anne, would you be able to send me your email address? I'm, I'm interested in talking to you about what's going on with the lore, the learning object repository. Thank you. Hey, Spencer? Is there yeah, hey, Glenn. A, is there a uh, broad other than going into each college's like list of of classes is there a colorado community college wide um faculty list so that if i if i want to you know put all the other biology or political science or whatever instructors on blast and say hey what are you using you know rather than hunting and pecking through every single college's, you know, list of instructors. Is, is there some sort of database for that or? We, we don't have a, a, a list of contacts. What we do have is some stakeholder groups. We have a faculty, Colorado Faculty Advisory Council, which is, um, I think in, um, in the community college system, it's, they have, there's something similar, but ours is, <clears throat> inclusive of all the public institutions at the Department of Higher Ed might be a good place to start in terms of, you know, perhaps they maintain lists for their respective institutions. So I could put you in, in contact with the chairs of the C, we call them CFAC, Colorado Faculty Advisory Council. That might be a good starting point to say, hey, looking for biology faculty, or I'd be happy to work with, with you too, Glenn, to say, hey, Glenn and I are looking for biology faculty, you know, on, on each of these campuses. Yeah, well, I, I happen to be political science. I was just using that as, a, oh, okay. as an option. But, Poli -sci, um, sure. you know, I, it was it, it was a little weird that, you know, I was asking literally one of the other political science people what their discipline was because I had no idea what they taught. <laughs> <laughs> and they were at Fern Range? 
too. Yeah. I, well, and yeah, and she's a front range, just front range, uh, Westminster or Larimer, I forget which, but not here. Um, so, yeah. you know, it, it seems that if, if there was, the, it shouldn't be that hard to, to generate the database of, you know, either by course name or something like that to be able to say, look, here is everybody in the CCC system that teaches, you know, intro to biology. Here's everybody in the CCC system that teaches, you um, you know, botany. Here's everybody in the CCC system that teaches, you know, it doesn't matter what the class is. And that way you've got one stack of names that you can send out in one email and say, hey, I'm looking at, at you know, adjusting my, my class. What textbook do you use? And do any of you use open source? And if so, what is it? And that would be a good call out for the OER committee at Front Range, because I know Front Range is, Front Range is our largest, um, community college and it's because of the three campuses so I can imagine the just just navigating within front range is, is a challenge let alone with the other community colleges and, and your peers throughout the state which that could be rich conversation um, but might be a good call for for and and I'll come back to I'll tell Gene a little bit more about some of the discussions that we've had too and not not by name for anybody but more by theme for some of the feedback here and, and kind of that central theme around communication, because I think it's really important and something that we should look at to like, how can we support front range in, in kind of communicating and broadcasting further. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is our faculty conference, which is held semesterly. So, you know, tw twice a year really and we usually convene by discipline. And so what I've been trying to do is softly introduce people to uh, some of the, the OER conversation in, in those faculty conferences. And so I don't think we have, we didn't have one this past fall because of the pandemic and it was, I guess it was just wasn't on the docket, but there should be one this spring. And so that might be another place that we can start to at least introduce people to, to some of the stuff that we know and continue that conversation. But in terms of like lists, which I think is going to be the most effective, as you mentioned, that's probably going to be at the institutional level. So something for for Gene and the committee to consider. Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've today it spiked me to do some digging and um, I cannot find a intro to political science OER document. You know, there's there's a bunch for American government, but your baseline intro course just doesn't seem to exist so um you know may, maybe that's an opportunity to sit down you know maybe network and create one you know yeah so. oh absolutely and i mean and that's a good question for somebody like shay too like hey here's what i'm here's what we're missing you know or like i know there's some really cool colorado specific courses where oers could be developed too or if you want to contextualize introductory to political science to the Colorado content or like, you know, using Colorado examples, I think localization is another advantage. And I think that was mentioned during the keynote, but like localization of content is something that I'm really excited about because it resonates with students so much more. And we've seen kind of, we've seen the engagement and kind of effectiveness of those uh, materials in some of those studies, like the Georgia study you know, when localization is used. So, um, that would be a really cool project, I think, but I think everything yeah. would be cool. Yeah, well, I've, I've, uh, I've got, um, I'm going to be sending Che a, a, a quick ping as well, so. Oh, please do. Um, <laughs> so. Um, um, I, I like working, I like communicating, and um, uh, content building is, um, not only is it a part of, you know, our, our positions that we have, um, but the ease of access for students really does, you know, that, that falls into the student retention. And I think student success, I have no stats to prove that, but being a student in the Colorado community college system for so long, um, I can speak from experience. So I think that there's definitely a whole or two that we've identified today. And there's definitely um, room to, uh, to, to, to work together and help uh, help fill those gaps. Um, awesome, awesome, Shay. Yes, we need you. Yes. 
Well, thank you all for joining. I mean, mm -hmm. let me know if you have anything else and I'm always, I'm always happy to connect.